Well, they announced it today, but we are actually going on a short-term mission trip this week in STM, and we're going to a foreign country. We're going to Texas. Some say it's a foreign country. It was a foreign country at one point, and then it became America, and then it broke away in the Civil War, then it became America again, so you know. It could secede again. I've heard that Texas has wanted to do this in the past. And technically, I think they're the only state that's actually allowed to. Not that they'd actually be allowed to. There'd probably be a lot of fights about that. Um, But they could leave because they're the foreign country. But whenever you're traveling to a foreign country, one of the most important questions you need to get right is, can I drink the water? And I'm here today to tell you, if you're going to Texas... I think you're pretty safe to drink the water. I know. It's not like going to Guatemala or Honduras or a country in Africa where maybe they say, hey, don't drink the water. There's stuff in the water. It's fine for locals because their systems are used to it, but it's not fine for you because your system's not used to it. And some of that good tasting water, uh, I don't know if it's good tasting, but uh, some of that water that feels really good could uh, lead to uh, high amounts of death. It's interesting. Wherever you find water, you always find life. If you find good water, healthy water, you're going to find things that are growing. You can find things that are growing in remote places as long as there's a good source of water, if there's a fountain of water. And that's how it was in Bible times. It was very important that you would have a source of water wherever you go because a lot of places didn't have that. In fact, when the Israelites were in Egypt, One of the problems was, as they move out of Egypt, they have less stable sources of water. Because if you live in Egypt, you've got one big river, the Nile, right? And if you don't believe it, you're in denial, right? So, um, yeah, sorry, I just had to sneak that in. I know. But they had the Nile River. It was a constant, steady stream that would always give you water. And when you go to a different land, the land of Israel is not built like that. In fact, the land of Israel is built so that it's really dependent on rainwater. If it doesn't rain in the winter, you're not going to have snow and you're not going to have water that fills all the natural springs of water and you're in big trouble. So the people of Israel, as they grew up, were super used to the idea of needing a good source of water, which is why the text today is going to say that your heart is like a source of water. Your heart, the human heart. For the whole bit of everything that you do in your life, your heart is like a fountain of water. What does that mean? It means that if the fountain of water of your heart is healthy and good, what's gonna happen is everything that flows out of your heart is going to be good. Your words, your actions, your choices. It's gonna be good if the condition of your heart is good, but sadly, the same is also true. That if the condition of your heart is bad, corrupt, sinful, then what will happen is out of the overflow of the heart, your whole life will be lived. But the principle's true, whether you got a good heart or a bad heart. We live out of our hearts. So to see this, I want us all to turn to Proverbs chapter four together. So open a Bible, let's look at Proverbs four together. Remember, this is a father giving instruction to a son. In fact, we can put some names on this. This is King Solomon giving instructions to his sons. I say that because in chapter 4, he gets even more specific about where he learned all this wisdom from. That's pretty important. If someone's going to teach you something, and they're pretty wise, one of the main questions that you're going to ask is, well, where did you learn that? Who told you that? I'm not sure I'm going to listen unless I trust the source. Well, Solomon had a dad. I think you know who his name is. Solomon's dad was David. He described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, and in Proverbs chapter 4, it's very clear that the instruction that Solomon is giving is not something that he made up. It's actually something his father taught to him. If you're in Proverbs 4, let's just start with the beginning of the chapter real quick. Before we jump to the main text we're going to look at about the human heart, look at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, hear, O sons, a father's instruction. So it's probably not just Rehoboam who's listening to this, the one who would be king. It's probably a lot of Solomon's sons listening to this. He says, hear, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Basically, that's the the classic line of every parent. Say, hey, remember what I'm telling you. When I'm not telling you anymore, remember it when you go to college. Remember it when you're an adult. Remember the lessons I'm teaching you now when you're a parent one day with your kid. This is common. Parents tell their kids this all the time. But look what he says. In verse three, he says, when I was a son with my father, so Solomon with David. I want you to think back. As you know the Bible, what was happening when Solomon grew up? He did not grow up like David. David grew up as a relatively poor person. He grew up 
working with animals. He grew up in a place where he was taught by his father, Jesse, and his older brothers what it meant to live for God in a kind of a rougher environment. That's not how Solomon grew up. Solomon was one of the kids that was born late in David's life, so late that probably his oldest kids were maybe 20, 25 when Solomon was born. Remember, Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, and they came later on to the scene. They were not there at the beginning of David's life. So this was a later marriage and a later son, probably born in David's old age. And I want you to think, where did Solomon, this wise person, where did he grow up? He did not grow up with the animals. He did not grow up in the pasture. He grew up in the palace. Solomon grew up with his father, probably of a, you know, his father was probably an old age when Solomon was growing up. Uh, David was probably 55, 60, 65. David dies uh, at 70 years old, and Solomon was about 20 when he took the throne. So he was born when his dad was about 50. So some of you got older parents, maybe that old, maybe less old. But he was a later marriage, second marriage, late, not second, but later on. Um, and he grew up with his dad, but specifically with his mom. It says even here, which we see it played out in the text, that he was tender and the only one in the sight of his mother. He was kind of a mama's boy. Uh, in fact, Solomon and David were very different, so different, in fact, that David spent his youth fighting and beating Goliath and joining Saul's army. And then he spent his young adult years on the run with the mighty men. Like, David was a tough dude. What about Solomon? Solomon grew up in the palace. Solomon always lived in the shadow of his father, who was a mighty warrior. Solomon was not like that. But he looks back on his time as a kid and says, my father taught me valuable wisdom. And here's what he taught in verse 4. He taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Do you notice the first thing he says is let your heart hold fast to my teaching. You've got to listen with your heart. It's interesting because the Bible talks about David and Solomon, and it doesn't talk about everybody in this way, but the Bible describes the condition of their heart at different times. David, in fact, when he's young, is called a man after God's own heart. Like David cares about what God cares about. David's heart is godly. It's rightly aligned with God, so much so that the things that David did even some of the things that felt like risky behavior, even some of the, the feats that he performed in the military, they're always given kind of a thumbs up in the Bible. Why? Because his heart was right with God. He was living in a right relationship with God. So the things that flowed out of his life, so to speak, they were good. There came a time in his life where his heart was not set on the Lord. And when his heart was not set on the Lord, he really ruined a lot of things in his life. He committed adultery, and that was a huge problem, obviously, as it is for any guy, but it ruined a lot of things in his family, so much so that the prophet Nathan said, because you did this, the sword will never depart from your household. There's always going to be your kids fighting against each other, and that's what happens for the rest of the book of 2 Samuel. When does Solomon grow up in that time period where dad was living the consequences of dad's bad decisions. So what does David say to Solomon? You better set your heart on God. You better do that. And you know what? For Solomon, he was doing really well at that. When he became king, his heart was set on following the Lord. So much so that in 1 Kings chapter 2, David says, you need to be a man, you need to step up, you need to be king, and you need to set your heart to obey God's word. That was his final words to his son before he died. In chapter 3, Solomon asked for wisdom. And says, God, give me wisdom. I don't need riches. I don't need honor. I need wisdom because I feel like I'm a kid leading this whole, uh, whole nation. You need to give me wisdom. And God gives it. But at the end of Solomon's life, actually probably towards the middle of his life, 1 Kings chapter 11 says this about Solomon. It says, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. Did they turn away his life? No, they turned away his heart. And because his heart turned away, from serving the Lord only, he started serving other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was his, the heart of David his father. So even the prophet here like, takes David's heart and Solomon's heart and says, David's heart, although he made mistakes, for the most part, he was set on the Lord. Solomon, though, not as much. So Solomon didn't even follow his own advice perfectly. We see at the end of his life, the book of Ecclesiastes is written, and a lot of things are corrected at the end of his life. But even here, when a father 
gives this advice to his son. Really, this is like a grandfather's advice to us. Now drop down to verse 20. All that introduction to say this. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. If anybody knows about the human heart, it's David. If anyone knows about the human heart and its flaws, it's Solomon. Keep these commandments in your heart. Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. That's what I was talking about in the introduction. That's what I'm I'm getting at. Verse 23 says, your heart is like a fountain, and water flows from the fountain of your heart, and it goes to all parts of your life. And if your heart is clean and healthy and pure and good, your actions and your words and the things that come out of your heart will start to look good and pure. But if it's bad and corrupt and sinful, then you shouldn't be surprised if the things that come out of your life, your decisions, your actions, your words, your motives and your heart attitudes, if those are corrupt and sinful too. So he says you need to keep it. That word literally means to guard. It's, it's a word used of the guards in the book of Nehemiah that stand guard and don't let people in or out. That's the, that's the commandment. Keep a careful watch on your heart. What happens if you do that? Well, then you'll start to put away crooked speech. That's verse 24. Put away crooked speech and devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and let your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or to the left or turn your foot away from evil. He says your whole life will be directed. Notice all the the body parts that are mentioned here. Your eyes, your ears, your feet, right? Where does that all stem from? Well, it stems from what you choose to do with your heart. And here's the main point. You, as a high school student today in 2023, you need to be so careful about the condition of your heart. You need to be careful. You need to stand guard for what comes in your heart and also what goes out of your heart. That's the commandment. That's what this is all about. So the first thing, I already said it, but if you're going to guard your heart, what that means is you need to guard what comes in your heart, what you allow. That's point number one. I want you to guard what you allow into your heart. What do we mean by heart, right? Let's just define that. The heart, what we're talking about there, is who you are on the inside. The Bible uses that word not just to describe your feelings and emotions, which that's kind of how we typically use the word heart. We say, yeah, what, what does your heart tell you? Usually what people mean by that is like your emotions. Sometimes people distinguish the heart and the head. Well, my heart wants me to do this but my head is telling me to do this, right? The Bible, actually your heart is more like your head and heart in English is more like your your guts. (laughs) That's interesting. The Bible talks about um, someone feels something in their guts. That's kind of what we describe as our heart. So the guts were like the emotional center, but the heart was more like the head. So confusing, right? Um, But what I mean is when the Bible says guard your heart, what we're really talking about is guard your mental thought process. Guard what you allow in your mind. That's kind of how we'll um, tend to define it in, in, in English today. Guard what you allow in your thinking process. Because your, your, your heart was your thinker back then. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man plans his ways in his heart, but the Lord establishes his steps. So concept is, what's the planner? What's the thinker? What's the deliberator inside of you? Well, the Bible calls it your heart. We're not talking about the heart organ, right, that pumps blood, although that is also another way to use the word heart, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about who you are on the inside. You need to guard what you allow in there. Now, here's the problem. When I say guard your heart, some of you think, yes, okay, I know what that means. That means it's a big bad world out there, but everything in my heart is good and pure. Right? Some of you guys are taught in 10th grade English class the concept of tabula rasa. You've heard that before? Right? Blank slate. The idea that you, know, you start out clean and innocent, and then what happens later on is the world just kind of corrupts you. Your parents just kind of indoctrinate you. And, you know, the world will just kind of throw a bunch of stuff at you, and then that messes you up. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does say that the world can mess you up. That's true. But the Bible says that from the beginning, our hearts are already corrupt before anyone goes in and tinkers with it. Before you allow anything into your heart, your heart is selfish. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is desperately sick and wicked. And then asks a question. Who can understand it? It's deceptive. 
it lies. Like, our hearts are not naturally good. And that's a concept you've got to have, like, just firmly in your thinking. Your heart is not naturally good, which is why when people say, just do what your heart wants to do, you should know as a Christian, that is a very, very dangerous thing to tell anybody. It's a very dangerous piece of advice to listen to. If you understand what the Bible says, that our hearts are sinful, they're deceitful above all things and desperately sick. The Bible also says that what Jesus came to do when he came to this earth was to give you a heart transplant. What does that mean? It means that God promises to do something to people who follow him to change their heart. That's the good news of the gospel, that your sinful heart can be swapped out for a heart that seeks God. Ezekiel 36 puts it like this. God promises his people. He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So that's what the Old Testament promises. And the New Testament says that's exactly what happens when we become Christians. It uses the word regeneration. That's from Titus chapter 3. It says that when a person becomes a Christian, what does that mean? It's when they repent of their sins and when they trust in Christ. When that happens, God does something to us. John 3, it's called being born again. Titus 3, it's called being regenerated. So like God brings us to new life. Ephesians 2 says we're dead in sin and then we're made alive in Christ. That's what happens when a person becomes a Christian. And so for many of you, you look back on a time when your heart was wicked and corrupt and always going after evil, and there was no stopping it. And then God stepped in and saved you and changed your heart, and now, although you struggle with sin, he gave you a new heart and a new appetite to do what's right, and he's causing you to walk in his rules. Others of you hear that and say, that sounds like a good thing, but that's never happened to me. And that's true for many of us here today. You've never been given a new heart, because you still have that same old heart. You still have that same heart that you were born with, that sinful heart that desires what's evil, and you wonder, like, why do I always do bad things? Why can I never stop myself from doing the bad things that I even know I don't want to do, but why can't I stop? Well, the answer perhaps could be because your heart is sinful, and you need a new heart. So the beginning of all of this is before we talk about, you know, guarding your heart, you just need to know that some of us today need to go to God and ask him for a new heart today. Some of you know that you've been fighting against God, and you know that you're not a Christian. Maybe you lie about it. Maybe you tell people you are. Some of you are just honest about it, and I thank you for being honest about it. If in your small groups, people ask, hey, who's a Christian? You're like, no, I'm not a Christian, right? Thank you for being honest, but what you need today is a new heart. God will offer you a new heart. He does offer you a new heart, and he'll give you one. The way that happens is by you turning from your sin and saying, God, I don't want to live in my sin anymore. I need a new heart. God, can you make in me a new heart. In the words of Psalm 51.10, create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I want to do what's right. I want to live for you. I want to stop doing my sin. But the problem is, like again, many of you think, well, I don't even have that desire. Why would I want to stop doing the sin? That's the things I like to do. And if you're there, then you don't have a new heart, and that's a good evidence for you today. At least let's be honest and say, yes, I don't have a new heart, and I don't want a new heart. The rest of this sermon, I hope, will try to convince you You should want a new heart. And those of you who are Christians and have a new heart, I want to encourage you that God says he gave you a new heart. God says that he cleaned you. He washed you. So, if that's true, you need to guard what you allow into that new heart. You have to be careful. You cannot just let yourself live life watching whatever you want, listening to whatever you want, being with whoever you want, even if you have a new heart, you can walk right into so much trouble that the book of Proverbs says, son, kid, listen, keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard it above all else. Stand guard on the outside of your heart like a bouncer who's, you know, 400 pounds at a nightclub, just standing there saying, I'm not going to let things, that was a weird image, but um, hopefully you can picture the idea, right? Like, I'm not letting anything that shouldn't be inside go inside. I'm not watching anything that I shouldn't. I'm not doing that. Why? Because God says very clearly that he gives us this new heart and we're supposed to watch it with all vigilance. Jesus even says this in Matthew chapter five in the Sermon on the Mount when he's sharing these blessings that people will have. 
It's, it's really, it's a, it's a form of wisdom literature. He's saying, blessed are the people who are this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they should be comforted. One of the things he says that should strike us every time we read it, this is Matthew 5.8. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The person whose heart is clean, that's the kind of person that's going to see God person whose heart has been cleaned by God, and frankly, also, those of us who have been made clean, who keep our heart pure and seek what's good. You'll see God. That's the thing about cleaning things. You got to keep them clean. That's the problem about cleaning your house. You got to keep cleaning your house. That's the problem about cleaning your table or your kitchen. It's like it gets dirty so fast. Then when you have kids, the house can't even stay clean. We get it clean, and then boom, next morning it's gone. But there's something I'm keeping clean these days, and I'm very proud to tell you about it. I'm keeping my car clean. You know, I'm keeping my car clean. You know why? Because the Elisa Viejo Town Center had this, like, uh, this ad that they ran that I totally bought into. It says, if you buy one free car wash, we'll set you up on the plan to get a free month of car washes. And I'm like, all right, I need to be careful that I don't subscribe to something that's going to cost me a bunch of money. But I'm like, okay, at least for the first month. Don't tell them I said this. But at least for the first month, I'll get free car washes. So guess what? I went and got a car wash like two weeks ago or, you know, a week and a half ago. And I signed up for this thing. I gave my phone number, my email, and I, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I did, right? And guess what? Got my car washed, right? But yesterday, I'm like looking at my car. It's got like some bird poop on the front. Like I, I, mean, I wouldn't like go get it clean, but I've got free car washes. So now, I went back again, and at lunch, I got a free car wash. I could, in theory, get my car washed three times every day if I wanted to. Because guess what? I've got a month of free car washes. When the month's over, I don't know if I want to pay 27 bucks a month to get car washes. I mean, that's like, that's like twice as much as Netflix, right? Do we really want to pay $27 a month? Like, I don't wash my car all that often. Probably not. I'll probably cancel, then I'll, like, get stuck on it, and I'll have to call some representative and say, hey, I actually I want to unsubscribe from this. But at least for this month, I'm enjoying my free car washes all the time. Um, now, I've only done it once. You know, I'm not like crazy. I wouldn't get my car washed three times a day. But maybe I'll get it washed once a week. I don't know. As soon as it gets dirty, it's like I can go back and get it clean. Here's the spiritual truth that I'm trying to illustrate by this, okay? Um, God offers us a new heart, and he also offers cleansing when we go to him. When we confess our sin, 1 John 1 says, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. And that's usually all that we hear in that verse. But that verse goes on to say, and to cleanse us, from all unrighteousness. I want to stop thinking sinful things. Okay, go to God. Pray to God. Ask him for forgiveness and then ask him to cleanse you because he says he'll do it. He says he'll do it. He's offered it and it's, it's more reliable than the free month of car washes that I have. Go to God, get cleansing. Guard what you allow in your heart. Because here's, here's how it all works, right? Um, you could have a new heart that desires good and godly things, yet you still have your flesh inside of you. Paul talks about that in the book of Romans. That even though you have the spirit of God in you, you still have the flesh that sometimes desires things that are sinful. James 1 says it's, it works like this. Each person is tempted when they're lured and enticed by their own desires. Right? So even if you've got a clean heart, you might still desire what's wrong. So you get lured in by your own desires, and then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. So you allow yourself to keep thinking about bad desires, then you start sinning. Right? Then sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. You keep on sinning, guess what? Death is a result of sin. So for you, you need to say, I recognize that there are plenty of traps out in this world that are perfectly designed to get me to sin. What are they? And I need to guard my heart from allowing those for me. They might be different for some of you. Some of you are so trapped by social media that you shouldn't have it. Others of you, it's not a big deal, right? But if you're trapped, you should, you should just be honest and say, I'm trapped, I need to stop, right? It's too big of a temptation for uh, envy or coveting. I just need to stop. It's too big of a temptation for lust. I need to stop. I, it's too big of a temptation for me to be lazy and to procrastinate and to do all the things except the good things I need to do. So some of you just need to stop. Is that a rule for, no, it's not. But like some of you should be wise and just say, for me, it's not good, right? Others of you might not be that. Maybe it's the, uh, the friends that you have. Some of you are lured and enticed by the friends that you have and you purposely keep going back to those bad friends because you think that will make you cool or something, okay? Um, you need to be wise enough today 
to say, I know my friends are leading me to sin, so I need to stop. Maybe someone else could be friends with them, but I can't because I keep getting drawn into this sin, so I need to stop. Are you going to be wise enough today to make that choice? We'll see. Some of you, it's just entertainment. The things that you watch, the things that you listen to. Sometimes we're so callous to even entertainment that celebrates the things that God hates and promotes it. And we're supposed to say, oh yeah, all of us with pure hearts, we think that's fine. I don't think so. Celebrates immorality, profanity, violence, pride, things like that. You'd be wise enough to say, what are the traps for me? I need to stop. And then, by the way, positively, when you were saying guard what you allow in your heart and keep it, there's also the positive side of what you should replace those things with. All right, I'm not saying that you need to you know, be reading your Bible 26 hours a day and you need to be, can't do that. Um, I'm not saying that your quiet time has to be, uh, yeah, 26 hours every morning and, um, you know, you need to be in small groups 54 weeks a year, right? I'm not saying that. Um, those of you who know the numbers, like, oh, yeah, that's wrong. Um, that's my point. I'm not saying that. You don't have to be listening to worship music 24-7, literally 24 You don't ha- I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is you need to replace some of the filth that you allow in your heart, even the things that are okay, and even the things that maybe aren't so bad but are so distracting. You need to say, I'm not going to let that in anymore. Start taking prayer walks, start listening to a sermon on maybe a book from the Bible that you want to learn more about. Listen to a Christian book. Start physically getting out of bed earlier, even in the summertime, and do things around your house. Start listening to songs that help you worship the Lord. Like, there's all these things that you could replace these things with instead of getting trapped and allowing these things that are bad into our hearts. I like when it says here, for they are life to those who find them. In verse 22, it says that. Um, The commandments of God, they're like that. You hear wisdom, it's healing to all their flesh. A lot of people have noticed this, but in the New Testament, there's a verse that says the same thing. In 1 Timothy 4, 8, that's the verse that says, you should train yourself for godliness. It also says, while bodily training is of some value, right? Working out, going on a run, that does give you value. But it says godliness is of value in every way, for it holds promise for this present life, but also for the life to come. Right? Getting up and going for a run is good. It's good for your body. Right? Making you sweat, making you have your side hurt, and think, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm so out of shape. Right? That's good for you. What's even better for you is for you to train yourself for godliness because that's good for your life now and it's good for your life in the future. It's healing to your flesh. But this guarding goes two ways, right? And we even kind of hit, hit on this. You want to guard for what you allow in your heart because it's a fountain, Right? If you have a, you know, poisonous water, right? that's bad. You don't want that to happen. But also, what you allow out of your heart. Because here's the problem. We've already just said that even if you have a pure heart, we still desire what's sinful. You could be a Christian here today, and you can still desire to be lazy, and you have to limit yourself. You might be a Christian here today who has times where you want to gossip about somebody, but then you have to say no. You have to restrain yourself. So this guarding goes two ways. You guard what goes in, but also a wise person guards what goes out. Because that's what verse 24, 25, 26, and 27 are all about. What comes out of your heart? Well, it's the the fountain of your life. So it says you should talk better. You should look better. You should walk better. Like it talks about your, your mouth. It talks about your eyes. It talks about your feet, which are all symbols and illustrations to talk about the way that you live your life. Basically, put this down for point number two. I want you to restrain what you allow out of your heart. Those are our two main ideas today. Guard what you allow in, and then restrain what you allow out. What do I mean by that? Well, there's three things here. Like I just said, verse 24, verse 25, and then verse 26 and 27 that talk about these three symbols. The first one is of your mouth. Right? So for subpoints, I wanted to make sure we made this super practical so you got little subpoints underneath that. Letter A, I want you to control your mouth to stop sinning. Right? If you're going to restrain what comes out of your heart, this is what we're getting at. First of all, let's stop the mouth. That's one of the most common ways that people show what's going on inside of their heart is by the words that come out of the mouth. If you don't believe it, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. 
He says, how can you speak good when you are evil? Right? Sometimes we're so focused on the things that we do, we're never focused on the person that we are. Right? You want to stop sinning? Stop immediately thinking, well, if I just didn't go there, if I just didn't have this device, if I just didn't have this person, then I would stop sinning. Jesus says, you should start by looking at who you are first. He says, how can you speak good when you're evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He says, the good person, out of the good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil. It's the exact same teaching from Proverbs 4.23. It's the same idea. Jesus just repeats it here. What comes out of your mouth is just, you draw a straight line to what comes out of your heart. So if you're like, oh, no, I know this really good-hearted person, but they're just, yeah, I know they're super profane, and they're, they're backbiting, and they're mean. Well, they're, they're not as good of a person as you might judge them to be. They're not. Right? Oh, well, they don't mean it. They're just joking. Okay, well, the Bible's very clear, right? And if you think about it, you know how it's clear in your life. What you allow in your heart will then come out of your life. The people that you listen to will always affect the way that you talk. That's just how it works. It's a natural principle. You could learn it even without the Bible, but the Bible is pretty clear to tell us this, to warn us. Jesus later says in Matthew 15, he says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. So back then, some of these Pharisees were so concerned about these ritual hand washings. And Jesus says, okay, you should stop worrying so much about washing your hands and eating with unwashed hands, which was not like they didn't wash them. It was like they didn't do a ceremonial washing. So it was a religious thing. It wasn't like, you know, you got dirt on your hands and you're going to eat that. Like, Jesus is, I'm sure, for washing our hands before we eat. What he was talking about was these religious things that some of the Pharisees says, oh, Jesus, you ate, you just washed your hands in water, but you didn't do the special ceremony. You're defiled now. Jesus is like, no, you need to stop. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles or makes someone unholy. He says, it's what comes out of their mouth. It says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. He just lists seven right there in verse 19. That's Matthew 15, 19. Those are just seven things that come out of our hearts that are sinful. What should we do about this? Well, I'm saying control your mouth. There's a verse that says that very clearly. Psalm 141, the author there says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. This imagery to say it's like, you know, your mouth like a door. Sometimes you just need to keep it shut. There's things that you want to say that you should just shut up. And you should just say, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to talk. Sometimes that's walking away. Sometimes that's just saying, I, I need to stop talking right now. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity. He says, I just want to stop all that. Proverbs gives all these categories of sins of the mouth, but I just want to give you some of them just to think through. What are some sins that maybe we're not controlling? Well, first of all, the book of Proverbs talks about lying or deceiving or telling half-truths or exaggerations. Listen to this, Proverbs 12, 12 uh, this is 12, 22. It says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Abomination means something that God just hates. What are the things that you just hate, that smell bad to you, or that stink to you, or that taste bad, that you just hate, that you abhor? That's what abomination means. To God, lying lips stink. But those who act faithfully are his delight. Proverbs 26, 28 says, a lying tongue hates its victims, and a flattering mouth works ruin. So you think that you should just lie to someone and just tell them they did a good job when they really didn't, or you think, oh, I'll just, I'll just tell them they're pretty, I'll just tell them. You do that, you're hating your victim. It's like you're victimizing someone by flattering them. You know what flattering is? Saying something nice that you don't think is true. It's nice lying. A lot of people nice lie all the time. This says, you do that, you're hating the person that you're talking to. Maybe it's not lying to you or flattery. Maybe it's gossip or whispering about the things that other people do. Proverbs 16, 28 says, a dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. Proverbs 26, 20 says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. If you look at a lot of your uh, 
friendship drama or the people that were on your baseball team or the people on your soccer team or the people on your volleyball team or the people at your school just in friend circles, you know, if, if people would have just stopped gossiping, the fight would have ended a long time ago. In fact, maybe it never would have started in the first place. That's not just some old man wisdom. That's from the book of Proverbs. God's word says that. You need to control your mouth to stop sinning. Maybe it's not gossip or lying. Maybe it's the combination of the two. You know what gossip plus lying is in Scripture? There's a word for it. It's called slander. When because of some envy you have in your heart, you make things up about other people to make them look bad, and usually in the same breath you make yourself look better. Right? So that's slander. Proverbs 11.9 says, With his mouth the godless man would destroy his neighbor, but the knowledge of the righteous are delivered. A couple of verses later, this is Proverbs 11.13. It says, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps the thing covered. Instead of spreading something to make people look bad, sometimes you just need to stop talking. It's your mouth. Restrain what you allow out of your heart. Secondly, if you are looking at Proverbs 4, look at verse 15, or 25. Proverbs 4, 25 says, let your eyes... Look directly forward, and your gaze be straight before you. So now he's moving from the mouth to talk about your eyes, right? Another overflow of your heart, your eyes. What does that mean? He's not so much saying, hey, make sure you don't look at bad things to get in your heart. Right? He's really talking about what comes out of your heart here. So what is he saying? He's saying if you have this commitment to, to do what's right, if your heart is good, one of the things that you should do is you should limit what you look at. Because like, there's these things that you could look at that would get you distracted from doing the right thing. It doesn't mean don't look at sinful things, although that's true. That's not really what he's saying here. He's saying stop getting distracted by clouding your field of vision with all this extra stuff. Letter B, I want you to discipline your eyes to stop distracting you. Discipline your eyes to stop distracting you. I think that's what he's getting at. It'd be so convenient for us to say, oh man, just don't look at bad things so that'll fill your heart with badness. I think that's true and we see that earlier in the, in the chapter, but not here. What he's talking about here is let your eyes be directly forward. He's giving you the, the picture of like somebody who's walking a tightrope, right? He, he's giving you this picture of like, okay, one foot after another. You ever done a slack line, right? It's, a, it's basically a tightrope, but it's like a piece of, I don't know, nylon cord. Right? It's like a flat piece of cord. It's, you know, only people with, like, no shoes and hippies and, you know, people with, like, Patagonia backpacks. They, they do slackline, right? It used to be so cool. When I was in high school, slackline was, like, the thing. And then it became, like, this, you know, move to Portland or San Francisco and slackline. Don't wear deodorant. And what, I don't know. It's like, if you slackline, no offense. I'm not saying you smell bad. I'm just saying, like, that's kind of what slacklining is. But here's the concept. It's like, what should you do with your eyes when you're slacklining? right? Don't look over there and look over there and say hi to your friend, right? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to look straight before you. Some people don't even say, don't look at your feet, just look ahead of you. Just keep your eyes focused forward and that will help you balance. That's the concept. He's saying, stop getting distracted with what you look at. Here's a way that this is also put in scripture. Psalm 119, verse 37. The psalmist says, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. It's an admission that we get distracted. Do you get distracted? I mean, how, how long does it take you to open up Instagram or open up Twitter or open up something, you know, when you're working on homework and then it's like, new tab. Like, what was I supposed to, oh, what was I doing? Oh, exit that tab. You're working, working. New tab. Facebook. New, you don't do that, but, oh, you know, new tab. Right? You don't do new tabs. Sorry, you work on your phones. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just showing my age here. I'm 25 now. I'm an old man, so, you know. Um, I'm old. So, you understand what I'm saying, right? How often are you distracted? How often was I just distracted? I just said that. You see that? If you're really keeping track, you're thinking, oh, John, you just got distracted. That's true. Um, here's the point. We're easily distracted people, and it's sa the same thing is true in your spiritual life. You can get easily distracted by things that are not bad. Well, the work you have to do. Have you ever tried to pray, and then you start praying, and then you remember everything that you're supposed to do that day, like at the moment you start praying, why, why do you think that might be? Why do you think that is? Is it because you have a great memory, and all of a sudden when you start praying, God just wants you to get working on it? No, it's, it's very clear. It's that your eyes are not straight ahead. 
You need to push through and keep praying. You need to push through and keep reading your Bible. It's like the times where you're doing the good thing you should be doing, it's the easiest to be distracted. That's true with your homework. That's true with cleaning your room. That's true with doing your chores. That's true with reading your Bible. That's true with any good thing that you should do. It's easy to be distracted. The Proverbs say this. This is a weird little proverb that I never thought deeply about until this week. Proverbs 17, 24. It says, the discerning sets his face towards wisdom. So someone who's really wise and really smart, they like focus their attention on what's wise. But the eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. Right? It's comparing two types of people, the wise and the foolish. The wise person is looking and saying, I'm only going to spend my mental effort today focusing on what's good. I'm going to block out other things and not look at them because I need to be looking at what's good. But the fool is always distracted and looking for, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do this. And guess what? If your goal is to, like, I don't know, clean your whole room in a day, if you spend all your time thinking, oh, what's this? This is really cool. Let me go look this thing up on the internet. And then you spend all your time doing that. Well, then you didn't clean your room. But a wise person who wants to clean their room, what do they do? They keep trucking. They keep working. It's true with your homework. It's true with your spiritual life, too. The eyes of the fool are always on the ends of the earth, always concerns with the what ifs, always concerns with uh, the things they don't know or the unforeseeable things in the future that they are not sure about. But a wise person just says, what do I need to do today? What's the next thing I need to do? If I've got good that God has planned for me, which we know that, Ephesians 2.10 says that God has planned good works for you to do as a Christian. And he calls us to walk in those good works. Our focus should not be on, what am I doing next week? What am I doing in a year? What about college? What about this? The eyes of the fool are on the ends of the earth. What does a wise person do? What do I need to do today? What good thing do I need to do today? I, I need to talk to God today. I need to read the Bible today. I need to stop being distracted today. That's what he means by set your eyes straight ahead. He also says in verse 26, ponder the paths of your feet, then your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil, right? That's the same idea of this slack line, right? It's like you're going step after step. You start with your eyes forward, then what happens? Your feet need to stay on the right path. Don't turn your feet left. Don't turn your feet right. Keep going the way you need to go. The way I put it, letter C, I want you to direct your feet to stop doing wrong. Notice all the things that you're doing, controlling, disciplining, directing, are all words that are interchangeable with restrain or guard or keep. All interchangeable. Your mouth, your eyes, your feet. That's what this text says. The point is to stop sinning, to stop distracting, and to stop doing wrong. What do your feet do? Your feet take you where you go, right? Obviously. And back then when you couldn't... uh, Go places with your thumbs, and on a screen, all the bad stuff to do was all with your feet. You had to take your feet and go do it, right? So I understand that this is an analogy that you can go and do a lot of bad things without ever getting your butt out of the bed. Like, you know, like you could just do a whole world of sin by being lazy and staying at home. But I want you to see this. In in Proverbs 4, that's verse 26 and 27, look up in the passage, and look what he says in verse 14. So he, he's going to say, make sure your feet are going in the right direction. That's the, that's the summary. Look at what he says in verse 14. He says, do not enter the path of the wicked, and don't walk in the way of evil. Like it's like, uh, you know, pictures like you're on a, on a road, on a path, and there's all these junctions where you can go this way or that way, or people are inviting you to do sin. He says, no, don't, don't walk their way. He says, avoid it and don't go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. It's this image of a person walking on a road. And there's all these different options for this person. He says, pass by. Don't look at it. Avoid it. Verse 16 says, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. That's a good image of how a lot of people live right there. Maybe even some of you. It's like you're not even content to go to bed until you do sin. A lot of you live your life. You won't put your phone away until you do something sinful. You won't say, I'm done with my friends until we do wrong. It's just the book of Proverbs. Just God's calling you on it. He's pointing his finger right in your chest and saying, that's exactly how you are, isn't it? They cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They're robbed of sleep unless they make someone else stumble. Not only are they interested in uh, sinning themselves, but they're like, hey, everybody, join me, join me. Do wrong with me. 
And one of the big ways that this happens back in the ancient world and today happens in Proverbs 5. Look at Proverbs 5. Drop down. Look at verse number 7. The father tells the son, you know one of the big, big problems, one of the big things that people need to avoid going there with their feet. Or maybe today it's more going there on their devices. Proverbs 5, he says, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. And he drops down to verse 7 and he says, now my son, listen to me. Don't depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Who's her? Well, he says in verse number three, the forbidden woman. It's just this image to describe sexual sin, whether you're a guy or a girl. He says that's, the, that's really a big path that you need to start walking away from. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near to the door of her house. Which again, if the only way for you to commit sexual sin was to go over to someone's house, you'd be like, oh, I'm good. You understand today it's very easy to commit sexual sin without leaving your room. He says, don't go even near to the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Anybody trying to have you engage in sexual sin, they don't care about you. They don't love you at all. Even if it's a boyfriend or girlfriend who looks at you and says, I love you, I love you, they don't. They've got a sinful heart. And the very act that they're doing proves that they don't care enough about you to say no. Don't give your honor to others, your years to the merciless. Look at verse 10, it gets worse. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Right? The, the image really, literally, is of a guy giving his money to a prostitute. That's like the literal image, right? Like a person was giving their hard-earned money away to people that would engage in sexual sin with them. So he says, stop giving your labor to these people, to a foreigner, to people that don't belong. Verse 11, at the end of your life, you will groan, and your flesh and your body are consumed. Yeah, some of you don't believe that right there. Verse 12 says, and you say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. It's like at the end of your life, it says the person who walks down this way, they're going to look back and say, hey, I hated discipline. I didn't, I didn't want to say no. I wasn't self-controlled. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I laughed all the way through my parents' talk with me. I laughed all the way through every sermon I heard about this. Verse 14, I am at the brink of utter ruin. This is just one example. There's plenty of other bad and dark paths the book of Proverbs says don't walk into. But because we're not preaching a sermon from Proverbs 5, I thought it would be appropriate to look at that one for a second. Your eyes, your mouth, your feet. Remember, all of this comes from the heart. The heart is where this all starts. Don't try to fix it by fixing the eyes or the mouth, the feet. You think by plucking out your eyes, you'll stop lusting. It's not going to work. You'll still do wrong. Don't think that by closing your mouth or sewing your mouth shut or doing something horrible to yourself will stop you from gossip because you'll find plenty of ways to do it. How it's all fixed is from the heart. That's what happens. When you get a heart that's pure and clean, then you start living purely and cleanly. But if you don't, you'll get in trouble. I actually heard just this week of a person, one of your leaders, who went to a foreign country and drank the water. Uh, now, this person didn't mean to do that, in fact. This person was actually very self-disciplined. And this person avoided all the water. I mean, they did really well. But this person forgot about the ice. There's some ice in this person's drink. Because again, like, look, that's an innocent mistake to make, right? Because you're not thinking about that. You're not thinking, oh, man, I better not eat the ice. But you know what? You know what ice is? It's, it's just water, right? <laughs> Psych, right? I didn't drink any water. You know, person came back and got really sick and, Doctors are like, would you drink the water? No, I didn't drink the water. Did you have any ice? Oh, forgot about that. Healthy water leads to a flourishing life. A healthy heart leads to a flourishing life. Diseased water, bad water, it will bring a lot of pain, a lot of death. Same thing with an evil heart. This morning, I hope to inspire you to want to live an abundant life that God talks about. But it's only in the ways that God says. Don't be wise in your own eyes and ignore it. Let me pray for you right now. 
God, help us with this. We are so prone to ignore your wisdom because we think we know better. Pray that all of us this morning would get serious about what's going on in our hearts. Pray that we get very vigilant about what we let in it, and we get very restrained and guarded with what we allow out of it. We know that Jesus taught the same thing, and really, if we just live normal life, we'll see all of this played out in our lives. So I pray that some of these students today would call out on you to get a new heart and would repent and turn from seeking satisfaction in the sin that they think is so great. Pray that they'd get off that and get on the path of life. Pray for those who are on the path of life to keep their focus straight ahead of them, to not get distracted, to not let their feet go to the left or right, but to keep walking as you would want them to walk. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.